Final Four week in Houston. Tim Brando joins us. Paul Craig and David Smoke here on 365 Sports. Tim, how much fun is being around? I went to the Final Four in Indianapolis. It was different. It was COVID, so it was all together for three weeks. But being at the Final Four and uh, and, and seeing some some friends of yours, games you've produced or, excuse me, broadcast, but just coaches and everyone else. Uh, I I live for it. You know, it's a, by the way, COVID was the last Final Four smoke that I missed. And it's one of only four Final Fours that I've missed since 1981 when I went to my first one with Dale Brown and his uh, LSU Tigers uh, in Philadelphia. That was uh, the last one that NBC had before CBS Sports got the rights away. And it was uh, Dick, Al, and Billy. And it was when uh, uh, President Reagan was shot and the games, uh, the, the, the consolation game, which was the last year they had that, and the championship game were, were both in peril as to whether they would actually be played. It was uh, memorable. It was historic. Uh, it, it actually won. I think LSU should have won and let's get away, but it was their first trip to the Final Four. They may have been, oh, I think they were, the best team there. But as you know, the best team doesn't always win. Uh, in a matchup for the first time for a program in the Final Four against a, a coach like Knight and a team like Indiana, uh, they took them, you know, they, they, they were comfortable in that setting, and LSU wasn't. Their best player had a, a broken finger, and that, that was problematic too. But, but, but being at Final Four since, and all of those were, for me, by the way, uh, just um, luck for me to be there. In 82, uh, in New Orleans at the Dome for the first time, uh, I was covering it and got a credential because I was a working media member in New Orleans at that time. I'd moved from Baton Rouge to New Orleans and had a nightly talk show at WPSO on Canal Street. That's how I got that one. In 83, I started calling games in the ACC for Raycom and Jefferson Pilot. And back, uh, North Carolina State was there, and I was going to do some work for the ACC and for Raycom. So I got to go to Albuquerque. And you you remember what happened there? Uh, same in, in 1984, Virginia played. Got to go because an ACC team was in it, and uh, and they took Houston to overtime before uh, Georgetown beat Houston, and they got their lone national title. And then 85. By that point, I'd gotten to ESPN, and I was doing some work for them uh, <laughs> in Lexington. And then and then by the time 86 rolled around, I was in Bristol and. Pretty much is going to go every year doing work for either Sports Center or for our basketball shows uh, that were part of it all the time covering it. And uh, from that point forward, it's been, uh, hey, I'm at the network level and I'm going to go. And in recent years, even though our final, I've, I've not been a part of CBS for now a decade, uh, the NABC, the National Association of Basketball Coaches, started having me uh, perform at their Guardians of the Game shows. And then after that, uh, emceeing and hosting uh, at their uh, panels for the convention as well as their champions luncheon, which is held every Sunday, where you see every coach that won league titles at Division Three, Two, NAIA, and Division One. And it's, uh, it's an honor. It's one that my hero, Kurt Gowdy, used to do when I met him at the 82 Final Four 40 years ago. And it's something I hope I continue to do until I'm uh, no longer capable of traveling. I I want to be around it. Uh, I have great relationships with all the coaches, most of the athletic directors, and and, and certainly the people that are in part of the uh, of the NABC offices themselves uh, in Indianapolis, which which really matters to me. It, it was Jim Haney for a number of years. Now it's Craig Robinson, who's uh, the brother-in-law of the past president Obama, uh, who coached at Oregon State for many years, and it's, it's a real privilege to do. It's a it's a real privilege to be honored uh, and, and be around them and to have them want me to do that for them. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm forever going to be there. It's a ticket to being at the Final Four. And, you know, I'll be about 10 rows up at midcourt with my friend Mike Oresco, the commissioner of the American Conference, and around all of the commissioners. I hope I see Commissioner Yormark there because they generally have the same seats in the same area. So I, I hope to meet him for the first time uh, at the games on Saturday. 
Tim, it uh, is Jim Nance's last Final Four. Your thoughts on his run uh, as the play-by-play voice of that for so long? You know, I was asked in the prior show that I was just on that forced me to be a little bit late to join you guys. Uh, hey, do you think Jim had in his mind, I mean, he wanted to do his last game in Houston with hopes that, you know, the Cougars, his alma mater, would get there. Do you, mm-hmm. do you think that in his wildest dreams he would be calling a game between FAU and uh, in San Diego State as the opener of the Final Four. And I said, listen, I, I've, I've known Jim a long time. Uh, he's a dear friend, uh, someone that welcomed me to CBS with open arms when I came in 96. And, you know, we started at about the same time. He's three years younger than me. Uh, but we started at the, at the same time. In 85, uh, he went to CBS, and in 85, I went to ESPN. And uh, our paths crossed many, many times during that period. And then later when I went to CBS, uh, he made me feel like I was a grizzled veteran of that place and was very warm and welcoming. I, I think to do something for as long as he's done it is an incredible feat. Uh, he's been at the same place, yes. Uh, I admire that. A lot of us cannot <laughs> – a lot of us can't keep uh, you know a, a, an address for more than, say, 12 years at the same place. I did go for 18 at CBS, but for, to go twice that amount, you know, 33, 34, 35 years at, at one place doing a championship game of that magnitude is unheard of. I don't know that that will ever happen again. You know, we just put uh, Billy Packer to rest, his longtime uh, partner, and a guy that I also worked with, and we had an association – uh, a strong one as well uh, for him to surpass that number and, and, and have that kind of longevity and still be in his early 60s is a phenomenal uh, borrowing one of his great moments there after the Villanova game a phenomenal uh, point to be in, in any career and he's not done yet he'll go another probably 15 20 or more years uh, doing the NFL and golf so uh, I'm really happy for him I look forward to being able to tell him so we we text each other from time to time and uh he knows i love him and uh, and i think the feeling is mutual tim i'm sure you've seen some of the the groaning uh about the lack of blue bloods or the fact that the td ratings are probably not going to be historically great given the teams that are a part of this final four but uh two fives a four and a nine uconn really the the only team that's kind of reg- or really the only team that's regularly in this spot compared to the others. What are your thoughts on these four teams and, and where we are now with this group? Well, let me tell you, those guys that are writing that, uh, that that's so predictable. It's a cut and paste article. I think it is representative of how lazy today's media is, how elitist much of the media is, and how saying it really doesn't matter means I'm not going to do my homework on it. So because I don't care, you should not care. I mean, my God, how presumptuous uh, for anyone to believe that, to say that, or to write that. And yet it's all around us. It's pathetic. And it's shameful. And this is just into those that feel that way. This tournament is not for you. It's not. It's not for those that are so-called... Um, uh, columnists that feel like if it's not a big enough event to cover, I really shouldn't have to go there. Sorry, that's just what you look like when you write such a thing or when you brought the thing. Uh, we're storytellers. And I was telling you about that conversation uh, with the uh, radio show before your, yours that I was on. And it was the same kind of sort of question that was defaming those teams that were there. And I was like, hey, this just is. Jim Nance is a storyteller. No one loves better stories than Jim. Certainly I feel that way as a broadcaster. And if you give me stories like San Diego State, FAU, and hell, even Miami with Jimmy Laranega's team, what they were able to do as a five, my God, that's a storyteller's dream. So I know he's, he's as excited, Jim is, to do what he's doing as he would be if Houston were there. Sure, it would feel awfully good if his alma mater had made it. I get that point. I do. But the bottom line is that this is for them and their coaching staff. 
and they lined up, put their jock straps on, and beat everybody that lined up in front of them. So go and cover the teams that are in it. Enjoy it for what it's worth because the Final Four is a recession-free event. It captivates our country. And if people don't want to watch anything but Blue Bloods, well, hell, just put a videotape in and watch your team play. Because those of us that care about sports want to see those that are making news now play. Yeah, I, there, there's so many stories, and there have been even, you know, Creighton, had they made it. I saw you mention their head coach, McDermott, on one of your tweets earlier today, or if uh-huh. Jerome Tang in K-State. Isn't that just uh, almost an elitist attitude that you have in college football and even in men's basketball about blue bloods, oh et cetera? God, yeah. 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 I, and, and, it's, um, and the people that are writing that, the people that are saying that, Smoke, I'm telling you, David, they don't care about college basketball. They care about how inconvenient this is for them. Okay? Oh, I don't know any of their guys. Well, geez, I have, go, I have to go find that out? You should be excited about finding that out. That kid Golden, the seven-footer from FAU, he's legit. Legit. Okay? He's a difference maker in that game. He could be, he could be the most outstanding player in the Final Four. You might want to find out something about him. Okay? And by the way, get ready for this, okay? Because... These flies in the ointment in college basketball, they're going to continue to happen. With NIL, with transfer portal, it's going to continue to happen. I'm already hearing those same condescending, most of them, by the way, liberal journalists say, well, you know, Kentucky's loading up, Carolina's loading up, they've already got the top recruiting class for that. Guess what? Top recruiting class doesn't mean crap when you're lining up against the 24-year-old and that's what some of these kids are that are playing at the smaller school. Get ready for it. The big boys are going down a lot more than not in coming years in college basketball in the NCAA tournament. And uh, this just in also, when the college football playoff goes to 12 teams, you might have to do a little homework on a couple of the players because they're not going to be playing at the so-called Blue Blood program. Tim, is it like sticking with the Blue Bloods, the – like that would be the like you fell for the corporate line, right? Aren't yeah. aren't you supposed to be like the ideals of most journalists are like, listen, I'm not gonna buy their BS. Like I know, like I'm about everybody, but then when you're like, ah, it's only good when the the good ones are in there. You're like, well, didn't you just buy the line of of that they're trying to sell you so that you don't learn about these other yeah. things and and yeah. put forth their agenda? Yeah. Most of these writers that are Johnny Come Latelys are drive-by media types when it comes to uh, college athletics. They're covering NBA teams normally, okay? They're covering NFL teams normally. So they didn't grow up on the college game. They don't care about the history, tradition of the college game. Therefore, they're not interested unless the right teams are in the Final Four. So when you see those bylines, trust me, they're not coming from columnists in the flyover state, okay? They're coming from the Northeast and they're coming from the far west. It's no different than the, the, you know, what we have in the red and the blue states when it comes to the news media. It's sad. It's really sad, but it's also true. So, Tim, uh, the, uh, the final four and the games we have and what Miami did in the last part of the game with Texas, obviously you mentioned with Dusty May in Florida Atlantic, San Diego State from the time when Fisher came in to start that thing and get them going – and then UConn. Uh, you've watched UConn before. They look like they're as dominant as anybody right now that's left among those four teams. Yeah, but when you add up the, 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 the point production and the difference between UConn and their opponents so far in this tournament, it's somewhere around late 80s or early 90s. You know, the total point differential that they've had in all of their games. I think the closest one was their 15-point uh, their game they had. Uh, to a hope, and I think after that, they're all been 22-plus, something like that. Well, I hearken back, fellas, historically, to Vegas when they were unstoppable and beat Duke by 30 in Denver back in 1990. That same team came back and was favored against Duke in the semifinals in Indianapolis in 1991, and they were behind for the first time all year when Larry Johnson was bringing the ball up the floor, and they didn't know what to do. No one had pushed them. 
no one had given them a hard time all tournament long. Then all of a sudden, oh, my God, we got to make – Leitner just made those free throws. We're down one. Mm. What are we going to do? That could happen here. That could happen here because we've seen it before. UConn has been dominant really since uh, the tournament began, and they had a hiccup loss at the Big East tournament uh, in the semifinal round that could have probably won that game but didn't. Uh, you know, look, uh, do I favor them to win? Yes. Why? Because they've got two of everything. What don't they have? And that's a true point guard. Tristan Newton was a guy that in the scouting report everyone figured out was a liability in the Big East. But so far in this tournament, he's not been, largely because we've seen Jackson, the point forward really for uh, Dan Hurley, save the day. He's been pretty much at the top of their offense throughout this NCAA tournament. Every guy on UConn's team can handle the ball. They all have the ability to put the ball on the deck and create their own shot. That's why you have to favor them, fellas. And I know a lot of the fans don't want to hear me say it because it's the kiss of death in my bracket for me to pick you, but that's the team you have to go with. Uh, let, me, let, me, let me go beyond that, though, and tell you this. I think that the team that has the best chance of beating UConn in the, in the championship game, because either one of these two are going to be outliers. We know that, whether it's San Diego State or Florida Atlantic. I think San Diego State is a little one-dimensional. They can hold UConn down, but can they score enough points themselves? That's the question I had with them. Florida Atlantic, I think, has scored. I think they've got players. When I saw them out K-State the way they did, you know, they were going to have to play with and score with that team. And they did that. Uh, they functioned very, very well in that game. And I was, I was really impressed. So I see FAU as the team that could give us an epic final against UConn. So those are my choices. I'm going to go Florida Atlantic in the undercard and with uh, UConn in the nightcap. Tim, is this the perfect Final Four to point to when they come up every other year and say, well, we should add teams, we should change this? Like, why would you mess with this magical formula that you have? Yeah, no, I think I think 68 is where it should stay. I know, listen, even before they went to 68, there was a lot of conversation and a lot of coaches that felt like 92 was the, uh, the way to go. I, I don't think they'll change it. I, I think they'll keep it where it is. Uh, I'm not going to rule out the fact that one day they might go to 92. Uh, when the next rights come up, there's no reason to do anything until the next rights come up. But since uh, AT&T bought Time Warner and CBS re up in the initial contract to 2032, I think we're a long way away from seeing uh, the tournament expand. I think it'll stay at 68 until 2032. And my God, I, I may not be here then. You guys might have to <laughs> deal with that. I don't know. But, but I, I, I think that um, uh, by, by uh, comparison, when we go to 12 in college football, which is a year before a new contract is negotiated, I think because a new contract is being negotiated after we experiment with 12 in the first year, which is the last year of the old contract, I think we'll go to 16 in college football with the new deal. I do. I think 12 will be 16 by the time we have a new TV deal in football. But I, I don't see it happening in college basketball until a new television contract is done. I used to think all those years, and Tim, you and I are about the same age, about why would they not have a playoff in football? Never thought we'd see one. Now, as you mentioned, it could be going from what is four. It will be going to 12, and then eventually, as you mentioned, perhaps even higher. Hey, I got a story about a, a radio guy from Florida Atlantic named Kent Lavica, not sure if you heard this story, and if you happen to bump into him, I know there's millions of people there this weekend. He apparently had his game, the, the connection was lost during the closing minutes of the Florida Atlantic game. He got it oh, back wow. online. They got back online for the final 30 seconds. Dusty May went over to his place, his location on press row or whatever radio broadcasters were right there at courtside, and gave wow. him a lengthy interview. Uh, just wanted to share that with you. I, we've all who've done yeah. broadcast had moments of, oh, dear God. 
Oh, yeah, that, that is an amazing story. And, you know, he'll remember that for a lifetime, as will Dusty. And uh, let, me, let me say this to you. When, you. when you talk about programs that size, I mean, that size, David, programs have basically what? A beat writer and their radio guy. Mm-hmm. And that's really about all they deal with all year long, okay? And for that to have happened, I'm, I'm guessing Dusty didn't know okay, about what had happened because he coached the game. But I can only imagine what it meant to him to have him give him that long uh, interview post-game. But I'm sure it was also uh, sponsored and something Dusty probably did and no one really noticed because, you know, only 3,700 people are are available to sit inside their their gym uh, in Boca Raton. (laughs) So, So. Probably of those 3,700, about 3,000 of them hung around to hear whatever he had to say because they they knew uh, how good the team was and how much uh, how much they loved both uh, the head coach as well as the broadcaster. So it's it, it, from my point point of view, it's something I would have expected, but I'm really uh, and it's a wonderful story for us to read if we're not from that part of the country. Mm-hmm. But uh, I, that's fantastic. I really do. This, this is something that we should be, uh, and I say we, I mean, those of us in, in media should be just through the roof happy about. Not not looking down our noses, not being condescending, not talking about how, what a drag it is. Uh, it, it's just a byproduct, fellas, of just how uh, vengeful and, and negative our culture in media has become, not just in news, but in sports as well. And I think it's awful, and we need to call these people out. Tim, always a pleasure. Thank you so much for the insight you give us, uh, the history, the memories of Final Four past, and even what you have this weekend. Enjoy the time, enjoy the weekend, and thank you again. I'm just America's guest from now till September, fellas. Yeah, we got- <laughs> <laughs> You're our guest, too, on 365 Sports. That's Tim Brando, Fox Sports, with a memory that's amazing. He and what John McClain brings to the table with his memory, also just phenomenal. By the way, um, I'm 